<clears throat> Thank you, Jack, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm here today re representing the Kirwinning Community Archaeology Project, which is a two-year project which we're through the first year of. So hopefully in this short presentation, I'll be able to give you a good introduction, at least, to what we've achieved and where we're hoping to go with this project. The focus of the project is to explore the medieval origins and developments of Kilwinning, both in terms of her abbey and the larger borough. As it is a community project, I think there'll be strands on this which aren't uh, straightforward and archaeological in nature, but I want to discuss which includes issues around communication, the importance of uh, a two-way flow of information and ideas between the project team and uh, the larger community and also that of volunteering, both active and passive, creating enough volunteering opportunities that enable as many segments of the community to take part and be involved in the project at a level they're comfortable with and is appropriate to their abilities. And last, uh, but definitely not least, and that is of engagement with schools. I think any community project must have a very strong element of going into schools involving school children with the project and really trying to inspire and develop uh, children's appreciation of their heritage and that they can be actively involved in exploring and discovering more about that heritage. So for those of you who have uh, heard of Kilwinning, especially lately, uh, if not quite knowing where it is, uh, I thought it would be helpful to start with some location information. Kilwinning's in uh, North Ayrshire, on the west coast of Scotland. Uh, in our immediate environment, to the west of us are the three towns of Ardrossan, Solcoats and Stevenson, and to us south is the Royal Borough of Irvine. They're all effectively coastal communities, whereas Kilwinning is set slightly back from the coast. And then, thinking of the medieval context in the larger landscape, uh, to the south of us is the Royal Borough of Ayr, southeast is Dundonald, to the northeast we obviously have Paisley, going through the Darai Gap, where Darai and Beeth are, and then up to the northwest mm -hmm. is Largs, which of course uh, carries in all of our minds the Battle of Largs, uh, and that uh, rather famous but probably quite minor late 13th century encounter, which reminds us that when we then look out into the Clyde at sites like in Shmarnock in the 12th and 13th century, what you're looking at is in fact the kingship of man under the overlordship of Norway. So we're at a boundary of uh, nation states here. Kiwining herself, uh, the origins of the borough are uncertain. The prefix of the name very much kill, very much suggests a church site, and the suffix of winning suggests an association with that 6th, 7th century saint. Uh, but there's no actually substantive evidence of a 6th or 7th century activity at Kiwining. On the right of this image is a very, what I think is a very nice fragment of a 9th, 10th century uh, freestanding cross. It's a shaft fragment and it used to be displayed in the gable end of a building at a location called Crossbrae, which is shown on the map, before being demolished uh, in the mid-20th century and is now in the care of the North Ayrshire Heritage Centre. This suggests that there may well be a 9th, 10th century uh, origin to some form of early Christian activity at Kilwinning. But very much the form of the town owes itself to the medieval development of Kilwinning. Uh, this is a rather nice 1790 plan from the Eglinton Estate Archives uh, showing uh, the town as it appeared at this late 18th century date. Very much an axial roadway running roughly east-west, running along a slight ridge of higher ground. At the east end is the, the River Garnock, uh, across which a bridge stands which was uh, raised in the 15th century. The mid focus of settlement at this point obviously is either side of the main street, but to the south is the location at this point of the ruins of uh, Kilwinning Abbey and the Abbey Green, which is surrounded by settlement as well. The Abbey itself is a 12th century Turinensian foundation. Uh, it's a daughter house of Kelso, uh, and its survival is fragmentary but very pronounced. This is the south transept, which is uh, a dominating feature in the skyline of Kilwinning and can be seen for across much of this portion of North Ayrshire. Uh, you also have other very important historical associations on this site. Uh, the lower image is the chapter house, which only the facade effectively survives, but is the purported 
uh, birthplace of Freemasonry in Scotland. Uh, what you have on the top picture is the now demolished and cleared late 18th century first built, purpose built lodge, which the Earl of Eglinton gifted land and monies for the construction of. And we know that definitely there's documentary evidence for the lodge in Kilwinning having been established by the late 16th century through the Shore uh, statutes, but it probably originated before them and is the first known lodge uh, well, in the world. So there are very important historical associations there for uh, a large portion of society. Another dominant element of our skyline is the much more recent, as you'll have guessed, 1816 Bell Tower, the David Howerton designed replacement for the medieval tower. There were two medieval towers originally at the west end of the nave of Kilwinning Abbey. Uh, one fell in antiquity and the other stood into the 19th century. And this was uh, replaced after it fell uh, with a, by public subscription, new bell tower. The bell tower, though obviously 19th century, enables the continuation of another long piece of the heritage of Kilwinning, which is the ancient society of Kilwinning Arches. Uh, purportedly a 1488 foundation, uh, the Kilwinning Arches annually take part in the Papingo shoot, where a wooden do is placed at the top of the tower, and uh, people with arrows attempt not to blind themselves by the, their own arrows coming back down after attempting to dislodge said do. Uh, but it's very nice to show the scale of long-term and the longevity of the community involvement in this site long after it ceased to be an abbey. And this is probably uh, quite in common with most of our urban properties. But why do we have a project? that This heritage value, this history of Kilwinning has always been there, but no, never before have we had an archaeology project in Kilwinning. And the reason and the prime mover in this uh, must be recognised as being Irvine Bay. Irvine Bay is our local urban regeneration company set up by the Scottish Government, uh, given a remit to uh, reinvigorate and renew the economy of a large chunk of North Ayrshire, being the five uh, boroughs I mentally mentioned, the three towns to the west and Irvine to the south and Kilwinning. And their remit is broader than I think some urban regeneration companies take it to be, in that they're very keen to develop the community. Since they have five separate boroughs, they want to do a lot of work to try and strengthen and develop uh, new institutions and renew existing institutions within their communities. So uh, they were instrumental in developing the project from the master planning stage for Kilwinning. They adopted an idea that came out of the workshops they ran with the local company, funded a feasibility study which established the idea of a multidisciplinary, uh, modest-sized project which uh, attempted to examine the medieval origins of Kilwinning. And they are one of our two core funders. The other funder is the Heritage Lottery Fund. Uh, when you're looking at these, you need to appreciate that in terms of the Heritage Lottery Fund, we work out the Your Heritage Grant Scheme. This is the smallest grant scheme HLF runs for heritage and is uh, an officer delegated power to do the grants in it. It's so small for them. So we're not dealing with large volumes of money, and none of these monies are coming from the traditional heritage institutions of our nation, nor is any of the driver for the establishment or running of this project coming from the traditional heritage organizations of our nation. It is coming from the community and a company that's interested in regeneration. So, uh, to give fair credit, uh, the project is being run by the Kilwinning and District Preservation Society, uh, a local society which owes its origins out of much older uh, popular societies, including the Abbey Society, and volunteers staff the small heritage centre at the base of the bell tower. We are providing professional support into it, but virtually all the work is being done by volunteers. After being a wee bit harsh about national heritage organisations, I don't mean that as a negative statement about them. I'm saying that community archaeology, at its best, I think originates from the community and is not a thing gifted upon it. Now, uh, having said that, all the professional archaeological and heritage organisations we've approached have been very helpful to us, not through monies, but through professional help and sourcing materials and resources to assist us in our work. We needed an opportunity to hang the project on and really to get it moving. And this 1930s image of Kilwinning enables you to start to see where this opportunity is going to come from. Uh, our bell tower is there. This is the 1774 Parish Kirk, and here's our south transept standing proud. The cloisters, as you see here, are covered by a cluster of buildings. They've been fully integrated into the borough and built over by houses. 
uh, just to keep track of what's going to happen. And this nice structure here is a late 16th century uh, building with a 1596 uh, date stone on it. However, if you uh, go to Kilwinning Abbey now, what you'll see is a very uh, traditionally presented institutionalized landscape, nice grass lawns, gravel paths, uh, railings and, and very nicely trimmed bushes everywhere. That element of being part of the town has been totally purged off the site and instead we have uh, fragmentary ruins of our abbey. So how did we get there? The traditional way that uh, we always got from one thing to another by large-scale destru destruction and excavation. Between 1960 and 1964 the Ministry of Public Works uh, undertook to excavate the south side of the nave, the whole of the cloister and the western approaches to the Abbey Church. And this was achieved by demolishing late 16th century and 18th to 19th century buildings off the site. Unfortunately, the record we have from this time is limited or was limited at the start of this project to a run of photographic images from inspectors visiting the project and uh, some cursory DES entries. Uh, we had no small finds. Uh, there's a couple of larger finds which will come on to later and uh, definitely we had no substantive written account. The images we do have uh, appears to show uh, a picture of a uh, complex arrangement of structural remains being exposed, at least multi-phasing. We've got at least, uh, uh, at least two levels of paving here looking quite different in character. This is in the cloister garth. This whole wall, which is a, a, a later wall, is also demolished and cleared off site. You can just see the chapter house peeking out behind it. And this is a view across the cloister garth looking towards the west range on the left of view and the south wall of the nave on the right of view and you can see a large scale of program of excavation was conducted here which exposed an awful lot of structural activity. If we jump then to modern day you can see none of this is actually presented, displayed, visible or understandable at the level the site was reinstated to and uh, just hopefully not crashing this, if we jump back you can just compare and contrast and you can see the levels have come up from the excavation maximum going down the way. So this is very much what we hung our project on when we went to talk to Historic Scotland, which was the opportunity to re-examine what exactly survived from those 1960s works. We know some of the structural features visible on the images. We wanted the opportunity to go back in to try and re-establish whether those structural elements were there, whether they could be medieval, and whether it alters our understanding uh, or improves our understanding of uh, the evolution of the Abbey. Now obviously as was traditional in the 60s a very simple design was presented to the public of uh, the layout of the Abbey. So as is traditional on all community projects we started with a grand opening. Uh, the Deputy Lord Lieutenant came and uh, dug the first sod with a silvered spoon. Not spoon! <laughs> what am I talking about? I wouldn't be so cruel. I gave her a spade. And then we went on uh, very much to approach the project by digging uh, keyhole trenches aimed at specific structural elements we'd seen in the images to try and answer questions and to try and inform us of the survival of what had gone before in the 60s. So this is quite a nice area. It's very handy having a bell tower you can climb to the top of on your site, by the way. It, it, it gives you a great advantage for doing nice aerial shots at a very cost-effective but tiring uh, uh, means. These were the trenches agreed for our first season with Historic Scotland. All of these lie within the property and care, and we were granted Cheshire Mon consent kindly by them to take out, carry on these works. We were, our focus for our first season was the south side of the nave, uh, the cloister garth, the west and south range. Those in red are the ones that were excavated, those in grey are the ones that aren't. Now, as you'll quickly appreciate as we run through these photos, the aim was to re-expose what was done in the 60s. It's not to excavate or destroy more of the site. We were limiting ourselves, therefore, to working through backfilled material and recording and understanding that which was underneath it without destroying more of the site, so that we could give it back to Historic Scotland with the archaeological value unchanged in terms of the physical resource, but the comprehension improved. So this is a trench at the top side of the Cloister Garth, which started uh, with one of our very uh, good starts in terms of success in that we refound what we suspect are the rubble foundations of the cloister arcade and these very nicely then start matching up with the images we have from within the cloister garth of these uh, fragments of 
uh, foundation, uh, happily missed by the subsequent tile drains uh, put in to maintain the manicured lawns. As we moved into the south range, things started to come unstuck slightly. Uh, here we are, the north wall of the south range is visible just in the corner of this shot, and we have uh, a very nice, large uh, four courses of a medieval wall, uh, which is rather hard to explain initially, since we're sat inside uh, the south uh, range. Our hope was to inspect and understand that north wall of the south range from this trench. And it appears a very good medieval wall, it has an opening at the end of it, but it started uh, in our mind to ring alarm bells about uh, the south range. And these were uh, extended when we went to a trench that's at the midpoint of the south range into quite strongly being confident that uh, the concrete mortar base to the south range may not be the oldest. Uh, it is all medieval masonry, but I think we're very confident now that what you see when you see the south range of Kilwinning Abbey is you're seeing a work of fantasy constructed on our behalf by the workmen in the 1960s. Uh, they're using up spare stone and they're helping us by giving us something that they couldn't find in the ground uh, by just, you know, enhancing it a wee bit. What in fact you have uh, in terms of the fragments of the South Range which are actually there and still underground was the fragment you saw in the last trench and on the right hand side of this is a north-south portion of uh, medieval walling suggesting either a subdivision of the South Range or we would prefer to hope maybe a suggestion that a section of the South Range was alternatively aligned, falling to the south potentially a kitchen block on the side of the refectory. This same trench also started to show us that some of the structures in the 1960 images were in fact removed from the site after the image was taken. Uh, in this case, uh, the wall we found in the trench is this stretch here, and as you can see in this image, we have an east-west aligned wall, which is probably from later 18th and 19th century dwelling that sat across the South Range, which has been edited out after this image was taken. So we're starting to add now to the understanding, not only are we re-establishing the presence of medieval structures still here, but we're uh, evidencing the removal and editing out of some of the later structures. In the same trench, we started to get uh, a wee bit more complexity as well of what was missed in the 1960s. Uh, what will be hard to see here is a variation in the subsoil here and here, which on investigation, which Historic Scotland very kindly gave us permission to do, because obviously our original remit was not to destroy, but in this instance we all agreed it would be preferable to, we started to find post holes. So we have a post hole underneath our medieval wall and another one sat out within the south range, immediately suggesting that at at least some point, relatively early at least in the sequence for this abbey, we have timber built structures on site. Uh, we added to this in trenches to the west of the south range where we continued to find more post holes suggesting that some substantial element of the south range was, or a precursor of some form, was timber built at this location. In this trench we ended up with four post holes, three in a row, better than two in a row, three in a row and another one which you can't see underneath this 19th century wall which is a, a later overbuild from the borough. Now at this point you might say, well that's a very messy, uneven base to the trench and I'd remind you in these shots that the level we dropped to is the level the 1960s excavation went to. So in this case they left in a 19th century wall and did some deeper circling while not dropping the base to a common level. Uh, we also revisited that paving I showed you in the initial run through from the 1960s and that was very much to try and examine the character of the paving. The upper paving surface definitely looked to be made of medieval blocks, probably pulled off the abbey, but this lower paving area proved to have no reused material from uh, the abbey, and so we're very hopeful that this can reasonably be interpreted as at, at uh, most recent, a mid-16th century yard area, probably in the subdivision of the Cloister Garth, as it's being used as private uh, plots for the monks in the uh, degeneration of the abbey. We didn't want to focus so clear, solely on the Abbey. The whole point is also to encourage the community to recognise that there's more to the medieval uh, kill winning than just the visible remains within the fence. So we wanted to get out. We wanted to explore new, exciting places. So one of them was a trench across the road. We didn't go far at first. And this was an attempt to look at uh, the environs of a loca location where Tom Adiman, in excavations for a toilet block at the back of the Abbey Church Hall, found a medieval ditch. 
Uh, that found some medieval material, but sadly uh, nothing too substantive. We've also started a program of test pitting in gardens. There's nothing nicer than going into somebody's garden and making a mess of it. It sure cheers you up. Uh, in this case, we've been having varied results. Some test pits recover medieval material, some don't. And that's part of what we're hoping to do, which is build up a picture of where medieval activity is leaving remains in the larger uh, landscape of Kilwenny. And material culture is a lot of what our work within the Abbey is about as well. The absence of small finds from the 1960s is quite distressing. We're very keen to try and recover some from the backfield material. Now, at this point, you all say, or the archaeologists among you will say, ah, oh, but that means it's all unstratified. Quite correct, it is. But we know that they rework the material within Kilwinning Abbey. So it's unstratified, but all attributable to the property and care. So this is Callum, uh, one of our younger diggers at eight. Uh, but we set him to a task of cleaning up slates to keep him out of trouble. So, uh, of course, he got himself back into trouble. Uh, he immediately found us a medieval gaming board, a nice Merle's board. And uh, thanks to his work and the subsequent work uh, cleaning up all the slates we recovered from site, we now have at least seven uh, inscribed slates which were cast back when the site was reinstated. Uh, this other one, which I thought you'd like, is a heraldic beast of some form. Uh, we like the option of lion with a puffed out chest and an extended tail. Uh, we like it also because it's one of two heraldic beasts we have, and we have uh, more gaming board as well. So it's nicely starting to add to the material culture. We sieved everything which was a good way to soak up volunteers to keep them busy when there wasn't things happening in the trenches. But it was also a good way of recovering material. So that also meant we could uh, give volunteers opportunity of doing cataloguing and inventorizing the material coming off site. And of course, everybody's favorite, washing bone. Uh, we had a lot of human bone from the site. Uh, the nave was part of the parish graveyard. And when it was excavated in the 60s, clearly there was no attempt to separate human skeletal material from spoil. So when the spoil was reinstated across the site, they spread an even uh, amount of the former residents of Kilwinning across the whole property in Cairn. Uh, and so we're recovering this uh, for reburial. We have had a pottery assessment, which is the first assessment we've had of clearly medieval material coming off. And we've got, thanks to the work of Derek Hall, we've got the majority of our assemblage is fairly small fragment whiteware and redwares, uh, splash glazed jugs. No surprise there probably of local origin, mainly sitting, uh, I shall attribute this all to Derek in case I'm wrong, in the 12th to 15th century. So very nice for the activity of the Abbey. He also identified a, a fragment of an Iberian ware, showing some of our uh, more distant links, and some uh, Rhenish uh, German ware. Uh, so we've got some uh, international links, but we've got a strong local uh, assemblage coming out as well. Because of the project, we've also gone back into a lot of archives. We've done a lot of hunting, and we've had a lot of help from, uh, I'd identify Adrian Cox at this point in Historic Scotland. And part of that has allowed us to also enable us to identify some of the original plans from the 1960s that previously have been mislocated. And so we've now started to add to some of the original excavation archive. In this case, uh, a rather nice plan of that section of the cloister arcade. This is also a very nice chunk of a 9th, 10th century uh, cross, uh, which has lain in historic Scotland stores. It's always been attributed to Kilwinning, but nobody's been confident how it came into the possession of historic Scotland. Uh, the association was inferred to be Kilwinning Abbey. So uh, the work of one of our uh, volunteers, Jim Kennedy, has done some wonderful things with this. The association with uh, the cross shaft fragment that's in the care of North Ayrshire Council has long been known through the uh, common double beaded interlace between the shaft and the crosshead fragment which Historic Scotland had. But much more nicely now, uh, going through the 1960s photographs, we've identified one, or rather Jim Kennedy has, where you can actually see that section of crosshead uh, in the south wall of the nave. Now very nicely this was at the midpoint of the south wall of the nave onto the cloister uh, arcade. So it's both evidencing that this 9th, 10th century cross, the only known freestanding cross from Ayrshire, was broken in antiquity. This isn't a destruction of the abbey. This is material being reworked into the 12th, 13th century abbey when it's being constructed, or at least remodeled. It has strong similarities then to the reuse of early Christian monumental 
uh, architecture in uh, Whitton Priory, where I believe a similar uh, uh, treatment of material is there, a sort of uh, adoption or uh, abduction of an earlier Christian origin for Kilwinning into the later Tyrannensian Abbey. But returning to some themes of community, there is a strong strand in this of not just doing archaeology. Uh, Barbara mentioned at the start the time team, love them or loathe them, and the work they've done to massively promote archaeology. Community archaeology, like the time team, has one eye on doing good archaeology and the other on communicating good archaeology. So we do a lot of public talks before and after. Our excavations are open. This is a live property and care site. People can walk in. They are welcome to walk in and visit our sites as we go. Uh, we do a lot of work with the press. We have uh, a lot of press on site. We have an embedded reporter from the local paper in our dig teams. We have a local radio presenter embedded in our dig teams. Very military terminology here. Uh, <laughs> sounds quite threatening, and we've done a lot of work in terms of social media, uh, something that uh, took a wee bit of encouragement for some of our older uh, active volunteers to engage with, but has been pretty universally adopted now. Uh, we use Facebook because uh, we don't want to develop social media, we want to use it, uh, and we use it to try and encourage a two-way flow of information and ideas. We supply complex information in it through notes explaining what we're doing, what we're finding, and uh, notifying people of what's happening. This also allows us to look then at the demographics of who's using the Facebook site to communicate with us and follow our uh, project, which very nicely shows, for those of you who like demographics, that between 25 and 45, uh, a group which I think generally is a very hard to reach group, it's the adult population who tend to be working, tend to be active, and tend to not get involved. Children can be, well, shanghaied into it through schools, and, and uh, the older age profile are usually looking for something like this to do, but that age group is our strongest group in following us in Facebook of both genders. I would encourage anybody doing a project that they should be looking at some form of social media to engage with the people around them. What we also have done is try and deliver a breadth of volunteering opportunities. So in our first dig season we offered 400 volunteer days on site. Every single one was filled oversubscribed, easily oversubscribed. We had more than 120 people volunteer onto the project in some form, and we're only a year in. We gave a digging opportunity to 88 people on site. That's 88 people, the vast majority of which have never done archaeology before and now have taken part in an archaeological dig and received training, both formal training in our offices before and on-site training. We go on generating volunteering opportunities, there were volunteers in the post excavation program, there are volunteers being involved in an oral history program which we're supporting, and there are volunteers in uh, archive research as well. And finally, schools. From the start, we've gone into schools. We, we as part of our support, provide the capacity so an archaeologist can attend every school in Kilwinning, should that school wish them to, to talk to them about archaeology and the project. We go into local societies, we have school site tours and we actively go to the schools to ask them to come to site and give them enough advance notice so they can integrate it with their planned teaching for the year. Primary schools have been the best pickups, but in a month's time I'm into the secondary school in Kilwinning to do uh, a P7S1 uh, session to talk to them about the heritage of Kilwinning. Because of the success of our school's engagement, a volunteer within the project team now has put together a teacher pack and also is organising with one of our local primary schools a blatant theft from Lynn Lithgow, which is junior tour guides, where there's a P6 class who are being worked with both this academic year, ready for next season, to come on site and do junior tour guides to visitors. I think this is one of the most important aspects of the project, that encouraging children onto site to see a real excavation, to be involved in it, to see people they know from their community actively exploring their own shared past is incredibly important. It will inspire these children and encourage them to value their heritage and want to be involved in it. And I think if anything comes of this project, it's that engagement is one of the most important things we're doing.